Yeah. I'm sure some will still be coming from lunch, but um, I have a few pretty generic slides to start with. Um, so let's start with the second talk that goes into kind of the same direction as Owens, but from another perspective. First of all, who am I? Father of four. One of them is in the room. Um, I can't really code. I've done a lot of coding in a previous life, um, but it was all by accident. So I've got a business education and I couldn't afford the programmer, so I did the stuff myself. If I code, then in Python, because that's the only thing I can do. I'm in open source for um, about 20 years. If anyone can remember Zoap, the, the one with the Z, not the one with the S-O-A-P. Um, yeah, I was part of that community, did a lot of great things that some of them are still running. So we have a content management system at the city of Karlsruhe that is 15 years old. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I filed a bug in their bug tracker because they had a broken page. And they gave me the German way of saying it's all great. They said, the admins are not entirely unhappy with the solution. <laughs> yeah, so that's, yeah. I'm with SUSE since 5.3 as a user and around 9.1 as, I had to look up those numbers, um, as an employee. So I had joined in 2004, January 2004, um, and that's when we were in the last um, phases of um, releasing 9.1. So that was SUSE 9.1, not SLES. SLES 9 came in the same year. Now, how do, uh, did all my experience with SALT start? It was one day in the office, some of the guys that are back in the room um, basically told me, yeah, for SUSE manager, for our uh, systems management project, we are going with SALT. And I was like, what the? Why not Chef? Why not Puppet? Why not CF Engine, Ansible? I mean, we had been talking about all those tools. Um, other teams were using them. Um, yeah, but they came up with yet another thing. Um, well, first of all, I was pretty skeptical. And then I realized, great, it's all in Python. Looked at it. And as I said, I'm not really a coder, but to me, it felt easy. So over my summer vacation, I basically took the 2,500 pages or so of documentation with me on the iPad and without a computer, because I didn't bring a computer um, to Italy, to the beach, I just started reading about stuff, about all those components and so on. And when I came home, I actually started hacking. I didn't start using it because I didn't have like 10 or 20 or 100 machines to manage. But I, I knew a bit of Python and I wanted to just hack. Uh, and, and this is what this talk is about. And yeah, took this one as a, a movie reference. I'm, I'm running out of Star Wars movie references, so I, I, I went with uh, Casablanca Salt. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship and that's really how my first couple of weeks felt. Yeah, there are some parts that are hard to grab. And actually the, the, the hardest part for me was getting the YAML syntax right, because YAML looks easy, but it has a few pitfalls, and you have to, it's even worse than in Python, you really have to make sure your indentation levels are right. But um, going from there, it was really um, fun. Now, yeah, that's what we are talking about, not just using it, hacking it. Um, salt in a nutshell, I think you've heard most of that in previous talks, so I'll keep it really short. It's all about masters, minions, Salt grains, salt pillars, yeah. And I, I shamelessly just grabbed those from the documentation on the salt page. Uh, I should have borrowed those slides to you, Tom. Um, yeah, the salt mass is, of course, um, where everything starts. That's the management server. The minions are, are the devices that are managed. They have a daemon running. Um, and it's two things, commands, are they're actually not, not sent to the minion, but the minion listens to the bus and grabs them from there. And one of the things that I'm not sure everybody fully understands is that a lot of the filtering even 
works on the client. So um, there's a lot of stuff that's just broadcast to everyone and the minion can decide, okay, uh, they mean me. Uh, this can have a few security related issues, so you have to be careful what you're actually broadcasting. But it also makes the thing very scalable because you don't have to have an engine server side that determines for 10,000 machines, okay, I will address this one and I'll open an SSH port to that machine and do something with it. You just broadcast it and say, okay, anyone who's called X, who has a kernel 2.6 something or 3. Point something, listen, this is for you guys. Um, and then the results, same thing, and they're basically broadcast on the event bus. Um, execution models, you heard about the discussion about you know, item potency or not. Um, I think it's two different things, and yeah, some of the modules, um, you can write them in a way easily that, that, that makes them um, have no side effects um, or no bad side effects. And a lot of them are about querying, like I just want to know the disk usage, I want to list the number of users of anything, and those are, are safe to use anyway. Um, for others, like creating a user, um, it's really that fine line. Do you write code that always checks or do you write code in the execution model that, that just um, tries to behave like a function, do this now and fail if it's been done before and then have the state system take care of the other logic, checking whether it's actually um, making sense to, to do those. I think both have their... Um, their own uh, specific roles. Yeah, state modules and formulas, that's something that I'm still star um, starting to understand better. A, a state file is really just an individual file that describes part of your state. And then when you package it all up, it's called formulas. That's one of the things we are still working on, how exactly do we prepackage certain things like create formulas for OpenStack or create formulas for setting up a whole um, uh, SAP cluster or so, and how do we distribute them, how do we parameterize them, and, and what should be in, this, in the code and what should be basically data that you push on top of that. Yeah, I think we've heard most of that here already. Uh, execution modules were the state modules. It's, it's really a different kind of syntax in terms of the grammar, so usually, an execution module would have um, verbs like add, delete, kill, start, uh, and, and, and the um, state modules would describe a state, like it's present, it's absent, it's installed, it's uninstalled, or, um, or uh, stopped, or dead, or whatever. Now, another concept, um, that's important in salt is the grains. Grains are, um, yeah, the idea is grain of salt, um, are just data about systems that are usually generated on the systems. They've been misused a bit for using them as uh, roles. So you would have a grain that says web server. I don't really like that concept, but it's been misused even by some of the professional um, users of salt because I guess in the early days there was no other way. Yeah, but I see a, a grains uh, mostly as data coming from um, the system. And I have a few examples here, like the BIOS version, the CPU architecture, um, the, the host name, kernel release, kernel release, yeah. Number of CPUs, full name of the OS. So stuff that you may need to um, make decisions. Okay, is this system really a SUSE system? So should I use um, super. Um, that's what grains help you with. And then you can use that in your code. Pillar data is... Okay. Pillar data is data that goes the other way, top down, where you want to keep things secure. Um, a, a very easy example is if you, if you set up a database, um, you would not want to put the username and the um, password for the database user into um, configuration files that are distributed to all the machines. Um, so you would set up a pillar that keeps those um, secured and only exposes them at runtime to that system that you want to expose them uh, uh, to. 
Yeah, then, then finally there's the concept of a, a top file is basically the master configuration. Think of it like the index HTML uh, in, in, uh, on a web server. That's when you go into that directory, you want to know, okay, um, where should I go from here? That's where um, you have uh, this top file that would always be um, looked at um, as the default entry point, and that describes how things are connected. And you've seen before, I think that, that wasn't mentioned uh, really often, whenever you see those double um, curly brackets, that's been a very nice concept in, in SALT kicks in. Um, the rendering those files is not done in a single step, but it, you can have several renderers one after the other, and that's how um, SALT really nicely separates problems. So if you have the problem of writing configuration in a simple format, they use YAML. Now, if you need loops, let's say you want to auto-create a list of servers based on some data from your load balance or whatever, um, those looping, yeah, you could do it like others do it. Okay, extend your DSL and in introduce loops or introduce if-then-else or case or whatever. Um, no, there's an existing framework for that, Django 2, that's very established um, in the, uh, not Django, Jinja 2, um, that's established in the Django community for templating that kind of thing. Injecting code, like loops, like just variable replacement or so, into templates. Um, and they've just reused that, and you run those renderers one after the other. It's, 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 if you don't change anything, it would just happen automatically. So first, the YAML is parsed, no, actually, the other way around. First, um, uh, Jinja um, does its job and um, expands all the stuff, and then you've got uh, basically an expanded YAML file that's then parsed in. Yeah, but we wanted to actually talk about um, hacking it, not using it. Um, first of all, I guess most of you already know, if you want to get salt on OpenSUSE, it's really just a super in away. We have a stable version on OpenSUSE, both uh, Tumbleweed and um, Leap. Um, we will also soon have it on SLES in the Advanced Systems Management module. And if you want a more bleeding edge version, I've got the URL on the slides and those will be uploaded to SlideShare or so, I think. Um, we have this project called Systems Management SaltStack where we um, have pretty recent um, versions. So currently we have the 2016.3 um, uh, there already. Um, one thing that um, Owen mentioned already, um, it's really easy if you want to start experimenting with things. You don't have to create your own packages, um, clone the whole um, salt project tree or whatever. What you can do is really use those underscore um, directories and put things um, in there that are kind of local overlays. You play with them. Um, you can also use that, of course, for stuff that you will never open source for some reason. Yeah, But if you want to open source it, if you want to develop upstream, it's always a good idea to start first um, with playing around there. Um, and actually, Duncan has created a project um, with uh, Salt and Snapper that I'll refer to later um, that has a very nice example for, for this kind of work style, even with Vagrant. Um, a vagrant setups um, to use right out of the box. And then you can sync those things. Um, so the sync underscore grains command it only syncs the grains, but you also saw on the other slide um, from Owen that there is a more generic one that, that syncs everything. Um, and those directories exist for anything, all the components in salt. So from beacons to engines to grains, modules, proxies, renderers, whatever. Um, it all works the same way. Now, my very first experiment was writing an own grain. The idea here is, okay, I want an information, piece of information from the system, and yeah, the, the standard grains just don't do it for me. So I, I need to grab something. Um, this is a really simple example. All those examples fit on a page. They don't have any error handling, logging, anything. Um, so don't just use them, but use them as an inspiration. In this case, for example, we are just using Python um, to run the which command and check whether Zuber is installed. And if it is, it will um, return true plus the path. If not, it will return an empty path and false. Yeah, 
And it's e as easy as that. So you can just call something on the command line, um, probe for a file. Um, you know, you could use anything there. If you have an, or an, an existing shell script or tool um, that knows how to figure things out, or you could, of course, from Python call any libraries that you have. Um, you could use, of course, you could just read the, uh, the, the proc file system or so and return. And the nice thing is that um, basically all you have to make sure is that you return a dictionary, a Python dictionary, you build this dictionary um, with the, the data that you want to expose. That was my very first um, experiment. Um, this particular one actually fails on the um, SUSE uh, just enough operating system images because we are not installing Witch. We are using the built-in Witch on the bash and I just haven't found the time yet to figure out what exactly I would have to change because on the command line it would just run. Yeah, that's basically it, I guess. Yeah, I, I've, I've just not bothered too much about it because, I mean, this is, it works if you have which as a command install, it doesn't work if you haven't. Yeah, now execution models, that, uh, modules, that's the next thing. And again, same concept, you can use those underscore modules. Um, salt and snapper was what I tried first. My code is nowhere close to what Duncan and, and, and Pablo did uh, during the, um, the workshop we had um, a couple of weeks ago in that same building here for the um, SUSE cloud and management team. Um, but um, I got it running. And the reason for that was mainly because Snapper is such a great uh, tool. So first of all, Snapper has done all the abstraction of how do you handle snapshotting systems from a command line really well. It's well documented, it has dbus bindings built in, and then, I mean, dbus bindings from Python are just an import dbus away. That's really easy to, to use. And it even comes with Python examples. I've, I've given you the project URL from, from GitHub. And so you just go and, and, and copy, like, copy and paste the examples and you get it running. Um, so this is basically, um, all you need to do to write an execution model, of course, this one only does one thing, it lists snapshots. And in this particular simple example, actually, I just return the unparsed output from uh, the list snapshots uh, dbus uh, call directly, because it's already um, returning a dictionary-like structure that would automatically be uh, mangled um, and of course, it's not nice. You may want to filter it. You want, want, want to make sure that instead of just positional um, uh, information, you give it nice names or so. But, but that's if you just want to get it running, you know, pass, pass the data, pass it to the server, and then do something with it, it's as easy as that. And that's probably true for any other commands that you could run over dbus if there's a namespace, that's the, the boilerplate code you need. And of course, you'd need to put in some logging, you'd need to put some error handling in there and so on, and then it's, it's probably a bit longer. But that's, that's really great stuff. Um, yeah, the pros do it slightly more advanced, and there's a blog post from Duncan about it, um, and there's also a GitHub project. This is not integrated into Upstream Salt yet, because we're going to use this conference to kind of work on the, the design together with Thomas because we are not quite sure yet whether we are getting everything right conceptually. But the cool idea behind that is um, we are not only using an execution module that ex exposes the Snapper API um, to a remote engine, um, we are using it for state. So you can have a state that says, make this machine look like this snapshot because it would just always make sure before you do anything else, it applies this, this snapshot, uh, actually not by snapshotting the system or rolling back a snapshot, but by taking a snapshot and um, copying over all the files from that snapshot to the system that have changed. And you can also exclude files or directories that are not relevant for your configuration management, like your, um, yeah, your data, basically, or your logs. Yeah, another thing that I worked on, and if we have time left, um, I've set up the demo, um, is 
um, the so-called proxy minions. I mean, to be really honest, they are a bit oversolved because most of the problems that you can solve with proxy minions, you could solve before, but they are a nice way of, of um, giving yet another abstraction. The idea behind a proxy minion is if you have a device where you can't run a minion because it may not run Python or you can't control it, you only have a login um, into, uh, let's say, a REST API or any kind of, uh, maybe you have a command line tool that you can use to um, communicate with that um, tool. Um, you basically write a proxy minion that um, talks that API and exposes itself to your salt master um, as a proxy for those systems. Um, there are existing implementations for that for HPE OneView, for example, or for um, some blade center management controllers, um, some switches. Um, and what we did is you know, make it happen for those uh, Philips light bulbs. Um, most of the heavy lifting for that was done by uh, Bo, who is also in the, in the room today. Um, yeah, so if you have time, I can give you a little demo on that one later. Um, I've got yet another nice example uh, for something really different. And I think that shows the real power of um, how SALT is so flexible, um, but at the same time has same defaults. So you can run it out of the box with very little configuration, just following um, the documentation, and it's really just bringing up a minion on, and a server. It's probably five steps altogether once you've installed um, the software. Um, but everything is just modular. You can change the way every single component works by overriding it, by replacing it. Um, now, what you've seen in, in, in Tom's presentation um, here on stage is that basically anything that you do when the states are created and rendered, it's, it's all ending up in a big Python data structure. So you have this high state that's then um, compile it to the low state, and that's basically um, the input um, for the, um, the state engine. That also means that you can do that in a different way. You don't have to go from YAML, you know, expanding the YAML using Jinja 2. You can, there's an existing um, Py objects um, renderer, for example, where you can use simplified Python or the, you can use plain Python. Now, what I tried is we have this project called um, Machinery. Um, that was written by a completely different team at SUSE. Um, all the backend implementation is, is, is in Ruby, um, but the output of Machinery is a JSON file. It's basically two things. It's a JSON file that describes in detail what's going on in the machine. So what users, packages installed, services um, running, all that stuff, and if you run it in full mode, it would also create harbors with all the stuff that is not described well by just text. So if you have files that are not part of an RPM, yeah, you can tell it, okay, package all the crap up, and, and, and so I have overlay um, tarballs. I'm now talking about this JSON file, and I, I thought it should be easy to take that JSON file and use it as input, and basically write a renderer directly. Um, and I succeeded to some extent. So that's really experimental. Uh, it was like a, an hour of work, so don't get me started about coding quality or anything. And it, again, no logging, no nothing. But it was as easy as, it, again, with the power of Python, with its batteries included, of course, like there is a Dbus module, there's a JSON module that you can just use. You don't have to look for it or so. It's just there, import JSON. Now what you can do is you basically load your data and um, you will, um, be able to go through that um, JSON data tree, and in that case, I'm just filtering for um, users, and I create an output tree that has a dictionary with the user present directives. And of course, this is again oversimplifying because there's more data, like there's of course, um, you know, user UID, group ID, and all this stuff. I just completely omitted that. Um, and same for packages. I mean, this code will actually work. It will recreate all the users that are in the JSON file and it will reinstall all the packages. What it doesn't do, and that's really where I need more interaction with the SALT, uh, SALT stack team, 
um, in those cases where we have to figure out dependencies, yeah, because our JSON file from from uh, a machinery doesn't really take care of dependencies. Like, should I install that user first and then I can install the packages? Um, or can I do it the other way around? Or do I have something else that would take care of it? Like when we build images with our Kiwi image building chain, Kiwi will take care of those dependencies. Um, so I don't, I just pass it an, a, 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 um, an XML file. But if, if I'm in the engine here, I mean, Unless I specify those dependencies manually, which I could do because at that point I can write my own high state however I want. Yeah, but I have to put the logic somewhere. Yeah, there's more stuff that other SUSE people are working on. Um, in the keynote I already mentioned, we are maintaining Java API bindings for SALT. Um, the API is helping us with really keeping concerns separate, with um, not interfering with um, the SALT engine too much from SUSE Manager, keeping it all separate. And um, because the event mechanism is very strong in providing us a lot of data from the machines, we're basically just using the J Java API to um, listen to a lot of the stuff that's going on on, on the event bus and um, creating database entries from there. Like if we want to inspect the machine, uh, collect all the, the software and hardware inventory, it's, it's basically working that way. Um, the other project I kind of hinted at uh, already, now Kiwi used to be a, a project written in Perl. The newest versions of Kiwi are uh, Python 3. Um, which is a bit of a problem, so um, Bo looked at it in the last, um, um, in that same workshop we, we um, succeeded in doing the SALT snapper integration and he ported it um, back to um, Python 2 as well, so it will just work out of the box in the same Python that um, current SALT versions are using. And now you can play with integrating SALT with Kiwi. Yeah, so that gives you a full potential tool chain where you can go from inspecting systems to not only configuring systems, but also creating images for the parts that you just want to dump into a binary and use as a, as a baseline um, for running your stuff. Yeah, so that was a really quick run through what you can do with um, extending uh, SALT. Um, my, my main motivation really is to tell anybody who has some Python knowledge or is just the basic tutorial away from uh, uh, acquiring that Python knowledge. It's very easy to start working with SALT, extending SALT in almost every aspect. So if you want to write your own language to um, describe states, you can. You can use JSON, you can use whatever XML format you want you come up with. I'm not suggesting that you should do that, but if you have some existing tool and you want to try to basically make sense of an existing description um, from another tool, um, you could do things like that. You could write your own modules, state modules, execution modules very easily. Um, what I've kind of skipped also on the output side, so all the data that comes back from the salt minions. Um, there are lots of existing projects and also ideas that we have around using tools like um, Logstash, Elasticsearch or so, uh, where you basically just use the data that's coming back from the minions and, and put them into some um, NoSQL database or SQL database or log management facility, do some filtering there and so on. Um, so the possibilities are really endless. Yeah, I, I have got a question slide here. Um, if you have any questions, that's um, the point for it. If not, I could show you some of the LAMP stuff, um, just because it's fun. Question, yeah. Can you show the LAMP? Yeah, I will show the LAMP, and I, I hope it's all going to work. Yeah, so... Um, this is something that we originally did for a demo. 
at where's my mouse? Here we go. At SUSECon in Amsterdam, and then later um, I did a similar version um, with help from Don Voisberg from the States and uh, Johannes Renner from the Nuremberg um, SUSE manager team at the SALT conference, SALT Lake City. Um, for that one, we didn't only have three lamps, we had four lamp posts with three lamps each and a few backups. So that was a much bigger show, but yeah, I can give you a little demo here. Um, I'll just move my shell to the other screen. Okay, here we go. Yeah, clear. So, just to explain what's going on in the background. I have a machine running that is basically a virtual machine that talks to the salt master as if it was a salt minion. But in reality, it impersonates all those lamps through that little thingy here that has a REST API that I can call. And it's, it's connected um, um, through the network. Um, to start with, I wrote um, my own API call that really just was for the demo, so um, that's not part of Bo's code that he wrote. I just um, hacked it into it, and I didn't do the underscore thing, so that was just <laughs> directly in the code because it has to be, had to be quick. Um, this one, um, and I'll show you the code in a minute, is basically randomizing a color and um, yeah, assigning a color to, to those randomly and then um, sending what they call the alert command. Um, so when I run it again, it should start up with a different color per lamp. Yeah, it does. Um, so it, it rolls through all the colors, uh, hundreds of thousands of colors, and most of them suck to be honest, but yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's the fun thing. We were also using that for um, actually displaying state. So what's going on on systems. And I can show you some of that code if you are interested. So first of all, let me check where I have the, yeah. So I hope that's um, kind of readable. The have fun part is really just this little method here. Um, Actually, the heavy lifting starts here. The, the way that, that um, Hue Lamp API works is basically you pass a JSON structure um, and you can do things like lamp on and then uh, Hue. Hue is the, the color saturation, status saturation. And then I, 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 I use the alert mode, yeah. Um, and you basically iterate over all the lamps that you have and there's an API call again to, to query the system. Um, actually, if you just want to play with it, there's also something that, that isn't in any way related to salt, but that's cool, I'll show you in a minute. Um, there is a crawl plugin for it as well. So I can also, that's, that's what we do. If you do a demo and something doesn't work out, we can just fake things, because I can just, you know, go in here. And that's basically a, uh, a, a piece of uh, JavaScript uh, plugin that, that uses the same API. And you can change the color, you know, yeah, and so on. Um, the free version doesn't let you group lamps or so, but just show them. But yeah, for simple demos, that's really cool. OK. Good. Um, so what we did there is, when you look at, so that's the manager server, right? I have to type, if I go to my configuration, servers reactor, here we go. Yeah, so that's just a few examples. Um, the reactor mechanism can be configured by just putting those um, configuration files that are also written in YAML into the system. And I, I'm just bringing up one media, one start, for example. Um, so that one, um, let me see, can I?
Yeah. Um, this one basically, it's triggered by an event um, and it will then um, use the hue color call, um, set a color of blue, and um, in this case, it's, it's going after lamp number three. Yeah. Yeah, that was the part that was a bit hard with the demo because if you have more lamps, you'll have to get all the numbers right and you'll have to have files for all that. And it's a bit of a pain if you have to renumber them and reassign them to the thing. Um, there's no easy way. You will basically, if you mess it up after lamp 14, you'll have to start again because otherwise they are not in order. Yeah. And then basically from the SUSE manager code, we would send events, and I can give you an example. I think my SUSE manager should be up and running. With some luck, it's actually going to work even. Um, so in SUSE manager, uh, we have those salt states in the state catalog. And there are a few like the alert state. So this one is directly running the hue alert command on, uh, on lamps. I think I've assigned it to one of the systems. Or if not, we can just do that. That's not how it's supposed to be used, but it'll hopefully work. So now you can assign that state. I'm not sure if it's gonna work. Nope. But one of the other states worked, I remember. So if I go to my... This one wasn't heavily tested, especially not with those, those labs. But I think if I just reapply the media state, so that's what I've been talking about in the keynote. Um, we are not actually, in most cases, linking salt states directly to systems, but we try to always go through those system groups because that way you're um, completely separating um, concerns and an admin could just make the connection uh, without um, having to know about the salt parts. And this, the guy who's writing the salt um, states doesn't have to know exactly which systems um, those states are supposed to be running on. No, let me see if that one does anything. I had some effects running yesterday. Yeah, anyway. No lamps. Well, I'll finally try the other one. That's one more. Okay, that one doesn't work. Anyway. Another thing that may work is if I just bring up the, oops, let just bring up, um, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, okay. That's an easy one. Of course, those, the, the media one server doesn't run. Yeah, so of course, if the VM isn't running, it's not gonna do anything. Yeah, so let's just wait for it and maybe when they start it up, it looks better. Okay, but yeah, long story made short. You can do things like when the machine comes up, you fire up an event. I now have a, a, um, a Raspi with a sense head that has an eight by eight, so 64 
RGB lamp matrix. So I could actually, with the Raspi, I could do things similar to that with 64 virtual servers and have it all. Yeah, here we go. So that's the load balancer coming up, first lamp. And in theory, like if everything works according to plan, the other lamps would also come up. Yeah, you see, so yeah, you see, it's working. It's just operator error. Of course, if the VMs are down, Sol will not talk to them. Okay, so much for now. I hope that inspired you. As I said, it's not limited to Hue lamps. You could do things with Raspberry Pis, for example. On the Raspi, there is Python, so you can run it natively. I think Duncan has a cluster of Raspis now running salt, right? Yeah, with salt SSH. Uh, another thing that I really like, and, and that's really if, 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 if the, the Ansible guys talk to you about, well, but salt, they need that agent, and it's pretty big, and so on. First of all, we are um, playing with the ideas to bring down the Python footprint, because most of the stuff, um, that adds to the Python footprint is just overhead because you have a source file and you have a compiled file and you have a lot of libraries that you'd never use, all the documentation. You can strip most of that and you can, whoop, that's when the states come up. Uh, and the cool thing is, Salt actually waited until those machines are up and for some reason it actually works. So when it gets green, that's when the state is applied. Um, yeah. So with salt SSH, there's a simple mode where you can even execute just plain shell commands if there's nothing on the system but an SSH daemon and of course a shell. Uh, yeah, you, you need some, some, some bash. <laughs> um, I'm not sure about BusyBox, I've never tried that, but um, what you can do is even basically go in and with just plain commands like RPM commands or a curl or W get or whatever, you can bootstrap that system to bring up the necessary, um, like just install Python. Now, once Python is installed, you can use salt SSH and you can use all this um, execution modules or state modules because um, salt will then basically um, temporarily move all the modules that it needs onto the machine, use the local Python interpreter to run it and then either clean up or cache it for, for later um, use. Um, so you can go from zero footprint to just a little footprint because you need the Python interpreter to the minion um, running as a daemon all the time. And, and that's really a, a great combination, I think. Yeah, so you can bootstrap salt with salt. Um, not, not many tools can, can say that. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? You can ask now, or you can just grab me or send me an email. My email is really easy. I'm joe at suzecom. My Twitter handle is joesuzecom. Um, my Google email address is joesuzecom at gmail.com. And I think I even have that for iCloud. No, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, okay, thank you, and have fun with salt. <laughs>